Well, good morning again. Today is November 15th, 2023. And again, welcome to today's CPC meeting. The Seattle Community Police Commission acknowledges that we are on the traditional land of the Coast Salish people, including the Muckleshoot, Suquamish, Duwamish people, past and present. With humility, we recognize how much we benefit from living on their land and water. The Seattle Community Police Commission honors and highly esteems these tribes, and we hope that this acknowledgement will encourage authentic relationships with urban Native people and all Coast Salish tribes. I will now take attendance. Please let me know if you are present. Commissioner Lars Erickson. Morning, present. Good morning. Uh, Commissioner Phil Sanchez. Good morning and present. Good morning. Uh, Commissioner Adrian Levitt. Good morning, everyone. I'm here. Good morning. Uh, Commissioner Suzette Dickerson. And Commissioner Lynn Wilson uh, has an excuse absence and will not be here. Uh, Commissioner Raven Nicole Tyler. Good morning. Good morning. Commissioner Reverend Harriet Walden. Present. Good morning. Good morning. And Commissioner Joel Merkel. Good morning, President. Good morning. Commissioner Lajea Washington. Commissioner Officer Mark Mullen. Uh, Officer Mark Mullins is present. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Lieutenant Tony Gatke. Uh, good morning, everyone present. Good morning. Uh, Commissioner Jeremy Wood. Commissioner Tasha Johnson. Good morning. Present. Good morning. And Commissioner Erica Newman. And myself, Commissioner Griffin Patricia Hunter. So we indeed have to have support here. Um, we received the draft agenda. Uh, may I have a motion to receive the agenda? I motion to receive the agenda. Is there a second? Second. Second. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded that we approve the draft agenda. Um, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? The motion is carried and uh, we have an agenda. We also received um, the draft minutes from the November 1st commission meeting. Are there any uh, corrections to the minutes? Hearing none, I would entertain a motion to receive uh, the, draft, the draft minutes. Uh, I, I motion to receive the draft minutes. Thank you. Is there a second? I second. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded that we approve uh, the minutes that were distributed. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstention? Okay. The minutes have been approved from November 1st, 2023. Now I'll turn the meeting over to my um, co-chair, uh, Joel Merkel. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, we have a very exciting presentation this morning from Amy Smith, who is uh, present in the room with us today. She's the acting chief of the Community Assisted Response Engagement Team, the CARE team uh, that was recently announced uh, by the mayor, and she is here to provide presentation about um, from her entity and to bring us up to speed on what is new there and, and uh, answer any questions if we have any. So thank you for being here, Amy. Yes, absolutely. My pleasure. Would you, do you think I should um, log in so people can see my face? Is that, uh, if, would that be from the yeah. yeah. Sure. Yeah, yeah, that would be great. I, I prefer not to speak to a faceless crowd.
I'll just take myself out of here. Here, correct. Correct. Yeah, we have mics in the room. Thank you for your patience. That feels better. Um, I'm still gonna still gonna talk to you right here in the room. So um, to start out, I some of you I know and some of you I don't. In small groups like this, I found it's more useful to say just a word about who I am and where I came from, and especially how I'm thinking about these problems. Just a second, yes. Yeah. So did you want to turn your video, your camera on? That's kind of a point. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I saw myself and then stopped video. That's like an involuntary <laughs> reaction to see my face when I Okay. All right. There I am. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So Amy Smith, it, people keep saying like, where did you come from? And I think in part because the name sounds made up, but I am from Southwest Washington originally. I grew up um, in the Portland area. I've lived and worked a lot of places. I moved to Seattle in 2010 to go back to Evans School. I was... Um, career nonprofit, nonprofit administration, and I've worked in the space of child welfare and human services my whole career. So I like to say that I do best down low on Maslow's hierarchy. Anytime I've been removed from sort of basic needs, I'm just um, not quite as happy in the work. It's, I think, important to know that I come from a lot of different kinds of people and thinkers, and the older I get, the more I realize I was just really fortunate. I have part of my family is, um, is native um, from the Warm Springs Indian, um, Indian Reservation. I grew up on that. Um, lots of different religions in my early childhood. I'm the, a middle child in a family of six, and I was the first to go to college in my family and was a lot more bookish than the folks around me. And I think what that created uh, early on was a, a, a real interest in people and also a desire to understand what's universal, if anything. You know, is there objective truth? Are there empirical truths? Or is everything sort of relative? So I was around a lot of religion. I like religion a lot, but I got really interested in ethics early. And that's become sort of the, I think, the, the passion of my life. Um, it's just ethical, ethical reasoning. You know, I say design a lot. If you're um, in the space to inform policy or design programs or design interventions, you know, what is the ethic? What is the lens? And so, you know, I've stayed in, in grad school. Every, I make a joke that for about 22 years, I stayed in school. Once I got to college, I didn't want to leave. I just loved it. I was very, I had four kids in my 20s, and um, I think I... I think I was worried I was going to get um, dumb <laughs> um, from just being too, too myopic, just working and, and mothering. And I just wanted to make sure that my brain was still doing interesting things on the side. So <laughs> it doesn't come up in conversation a lot. But when I'm, when I'm referencing things, there is, it is theory that I'm referencing generally, um, especially ethics. And most recently, I was in the Midwest for six years. I was at, um, at Vanderbilt. I was studying cognition, learning design. And so when I'm asked a question, I really do like questions because I think... I, you know, I'm here to teach or to, to at least engage in the conversation or to learn something from the question, the person asking. So I am here in the public sector. This is my first government job. And I felt like that, people have heard me say, I felt like that was a significant liability coming in from the outside because I had been around policy. But, you know, informing policy is different, right? You can sort of comment, say some things and throw it over the fence and then hope that somebody acts on it and you go back to business. Um, I'm here just because I knew Monisha Harrell. Um, I had spent a little bit of time with, with our mayor, and they thought that I would be useful in some way and had a couple of different ideas for jobs. I was, I was working in population health, um, the big, big health care center in the West and traveling a lot. And I was a new empty nester, so I was a free agent, you know, and thinking for the first time about what I might want to do. And I... You know, again, I didn't feel any urgency to make a change. But one day I was driving and Monisha called and she said, Amy, what, what do you really like? And I said, I, I like complex problems. And I like trying to figure out, you know, how to message the solutions if there are any interventions that work. And she said, I got something for you. <laughs> and I was like driving through a, a hops field in Oregon at the time. And she started to describe this, you know, the, the pilot, the dual dispatch pilot. The premise of it and then to describe 911. I was out of Seattle until last year, so I didn't realize that 911 had been moved. I didn't realize that there was at the time called the CSCC department. Um, and she explained it. And so I it was intriguing, and I just started down this process a little bit. And you know, I'm really kind of part of police on the back end, so there's long backgrounding and 
Um, so I, I didn't rush to judgment about whether or not it would be a good fit. What I was really trying to figure out is whether I would be useful because I felt useful in the work I was doing. And, and then in the end, I just sort of loved folks more and more as I started to talk to people and I came on as a deputy director. What I realized, I've run small business before, I realized like 911's pulled out and then there's just no structure around it, right? There's no business support, there's you know, HR, finance, you know, branding, there's no identity. And I also care deeply about people. And once I was in the West Precinct, I started to realize how traumatic it would have been, not just for the officers, but for this 911 center. These are civilians. You know, again, calls did not go down in 2020. Calls to the call center went up. So even while people are, um, you know, feeling a little scared to, to exit the building, they're there trying to serve people. And it was interesting in those first weeks, I went to all the roll calls I could, all three shifts. Um, again, empty nester, I had nowhere to be. So um, <laughs> so I was I was there quite a bit. And it was just fascinating because, you know, I never I never considered what that job is like. Um, the, that there's a different kind of compassion fatigue when you have no closure, right? So people in um, first response, officers too, most of the time you don't know what happened. You don't really know. And I was used to social work and clinical psychology and things where generally you know how things are going and you might have a little bit of, um, of, of closure, whether good or bad, you sort of know what happened. So that's where I started. When it comes to this pilot, the dual dispatch pilot, um, again, I didn't really understand why it was called dual dispatch. I have, you know, it's called a term sheet that just says council, council has put money aside for this thing. It's gonna be six of these people. It's gonna to respond to these call types. And um, so it was interesting to investigate that. And the first thing I did was just figure out, I, again, I worked in nonprofit here. I know there's crisis response teams all over the place. So to figure out what are we solving for? Do we, do we need another team? Do we not have the right type of team? But I thought originally, after I realized there's Health One, there's CSOs, um, we've got police CRT, we've got King County MCT, um, you know, we've got crisis connections, all these different systems. Um, I thought, you know, I bet what they're trying to achieve is that you just sort of shorten um, the, the time, I guess, drive expediency, that we want to be able to dispatch the right team, get the best first response. If you have a protocol that says, if this and this, then you need this team, it'd be better from 911 to just send it. And the way we've been set up is that we route to police or we route to fire, and then fire invokes a secondary response or police does as well. And then sometimes there's even another response after that. And so it, looking back, it may have been naive, but I still think that probably was the issue. You know, I don't know if that was the origin of the design, but we should be more um, expeditious in the way that we help people. And we have protocols in place where we could achieve that. So I went to, you know, police first, um, and to, to that co-response team, I thought I was going to find 50 people, and I didn't. There's four, you know, there's four MHPs over there. There are CIT trained officers who I have huge respect for and admiration, and they're also under a lot of pressure, a lot of stress, trying to get to higher acuity calls, and they've got a lot of paperwork. I learned that as well, and so you know, Health One, it's the same thing. I thought it was going to be this big, huge group, but it wasn't. You know, it's a small team. And then as I, I traveled around, you know, looking at, at, you know, kind of academically at the community of practice and who is scaling and who's doing it well, uh, Albuquerque, I talk about it all the time because they're up to about 150. And what's interesting is when you look at their third year data, they just wrapped up uh, year three. So they've got 105 folks in the field. They've got administrative support and they're hiring 38 right now. But Mariella there, um, she's, she's become a good friend, and she said, what you're doing, you know, co-designing with the other first response teams is the only way this works. It's the only way. You stay anchored in the data just like you're doing. This is a sorting problem. Because she said, once it becomes politicized, if people perceive that this is, you know, that you are setting up something instead of other first response teams, it will fail. Um, now, I had already sort of assumed that, but it was interesting to, to watch her and the police chief and the fire chief insist that the public needs all of these interventions. Um, and Durham's doing exactly the same thing. I talk about them, it's a true collaboration. And so it's been an interesting experience now that I'm talking publicly to talk about the way I conceptualized it really is I've got my little Venn diagrams that I've got fire, I've got police, and then I've got diversified response in the middle. We need other types of teams to go out because even if we prefer all police or all fire, we don't have that, you know? So I, I don't even engage in that conversation. It's a thought experiment. We don't have that. And even if we did, we couldn't afford it. We, we cannot, those are very expensive responses. Anytime you have, you know, lights and sirens, it's expensive. 
And if you look at the model that says, you know, a, a lower level intervention is needed and it's also going to cost 15 cents on the dollar, you would just do that, practically speaking. So it actually has all come together really quickly. I mean, I, I arrived at some sort of plan in June. That's when I presented to council for the first time. Council has been incredibly supportive. And, um, and so is the mayor's office. And there are a lot of things that should have taken a long time that didn't. And when I talk about people being in alignment, I'm very sincere about it. That's my experience. You know, this new job classification was created right away. Um, it is categorized as a first responder, these mental health uh, professionals. And I did that on purpose to level set because you don't want police to be really well paid, fire to be really well paid. And then folks in behavioral health and social work to be you know, making half the, half the rate. It's just not right. And so I know it causes a little bit of friction in the short run, but it's right in the long run to level set and to acknowledge the work of crisis response and that that is first response and it's hard. So that's all, you know, kind of like the philosophy of Amy. I am having a very good time. <laughs> um, I really am because it's, because uh, again, it's a very optimistic space to be, you know, to, to feel like I'm engaged in one of the few conversations where people are nodding uh, and, and being very supportive and cheering. And I'm trying to, mitigate any any dialogue that this is um the police have been antagonistic toward me several reporters have asked me about that you know haven't you experienced this and i'm very proud to be able to say not once you know so if that's being expressed it's not being expressed to me what i'm hearing is we're exhausted please respond to more calls please grow this team so that we can do our work so i'm happy to answer like functional questions now or we can just talk about ethical theory um, but I, but mostly I'm just happy to be here and to know this group and know you exist and strongly encourage all feedback. Um, I'm not looking for affirmation. Like the criticism is a lot more helpful to me and especially the, any, any dissonance or um, just anything that I can't quite see in community. Um, it's just very useful. The, the faster I get that, the more quickly I can take it into account and weave it into design right now. So mm -hmm. now I pass. I can mute myself. <laughs> Wow. Well, I may be the only one that's interested in the ethical theory, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> be real the meeting with that. <laughs> but can you talk about the nuts and bolts? I think sure. there are six. Yep. Yeah. So again, I, I keep explaining it's really what council allocated. So it's these six positions and a manager. There are a couple administrative support type roles too. What I'm doing, I've got 911 is sort of half the business and then diversified response is the other half of the business. And I'm trying to hire and staff for people who can support both sides. So, you know, ops people who can support 911 improvement in systems, quality improvement people, evaluation, folks like that who can sort of um, be shared on both sides. I, they're going out at 11 a.m. and shifting for 12 hours until 11 p.m. And that's because these other teams existing, they, they wind up, you know, about six or seven, sometimes earlier. And for those of us who live and work downtown, you, you need folks out after dark. Uh, you know, it, it gets worse. And I mean, if I were truly following the data, I'd probably start at, at noon to midnight or even one to one. But I just didn't think I could hire for that initially. I thought that'd be I wanted this first team to have real clinical depth because I, I need people to understand HIPAA really well. Um, <laughs> legislation, municipal code, like I, I need real academics for the first group. So I don't know that it will look like that, you know, in, in a future state. But initially it was important. And so that informed the hours a little bit as well. They're just right across the street at SMT. They've got, I make the joke all the time, no one knew this place existed. It's called Suite 500. And there's no way to get to it from inside the building. So I keep making like a Harry Potter joke because you just have to know where it is. There's th these double doors, glass doors, and then you know it exits right up to the, the three parking spots. Um, so we've just got, you know, there's workspaces set up there, but I wouldn't let FAS build it out nice because I was like, I don't want to incent people to be in the office. It's not that kind of job. You know, this is like just a place to grab supplies, grab snacks and, and do a little reporting maybe, but these are people in the field. They're shifting in pairs of two. They're shifting 12 hours. So they do three 12s and then a floating four. And that's what Durham moved to because they found that now they've got about 50 of these responders that it's just easier mentally. It's really hard work. It can be very discouraging, especially, you know, when you're interacting with the same folks who are consistently in crisis. It's, it's hard emotionally. People who go into this work, they care about people. You know, so I think there's always this tension. Of course, they're prone to compassion fatigue, right? Because they care deeply. That's what attracted them to the work. And so 
it, I think it's a fair theory that it would be better to have, you know, every other day or to have three days within four days out. Um, the four hours are used in reporting. I talk a lot about that, that right now I want absolute analysis every single day, every interaction, and especially for what went wrong or what could have been better. The question is, would it have been better if it was one of these other teams? Um, you know, what if in a perfect state, what would this intervention have been? And I'm also asking this team to really document uh, the, the sort of gaps in the system. Some we know, right? We know that we don't have places to take folks during the day, but to get a lot more specific about that, because I feel like there's really good collaboration right now between, I saw Lisa Mannion apply between city and county, and then the state is understanding the systemic failures in the system. So we've got the CCCs coming on and things like that. But I would rather be able to say specifically, you know, I need eight more of these and here's why. And everyone in this work agrees because we can't afford right now to just keep doing more of everything. I think we need to decide what is the crucial thing, the crucial place or investment a resource that we need and we do that first and then we move on from there so they're in the field seven days a week and as far as expansion goes you know it's interesting because we're in this little dap zone which is really just downtown and then the the cid and my guess is that there's so much desire in the community uh my guess is that we're going to have to expand geography pretty quickly and so you know that would be adding a few more a few more pairs because right now they're already busy so yeah what else? Can you tell us about what you're seeing so far? I know it was recently announced um, and it's relatively new. Yeah. What, what are you seeing so far and the calls you're responding to? Yeah, it's interesting because the first couple of weeks what we were doing is really secondary response. We we're kind of mimicking what how police use their co-responder team or how they use the CSOs. Um, and again, I'm just I'm just stepping forward. So now they're starting to be they can be dispatched by 911. In part, that was to let dispatch get used to it as well. Call takers. There's just different protocols now that there's a new resource. I also wanted to make sure that patrol knew who these folks were, right? Because that could go very sideways very quickly. And because the branding and the you know they're wearing these blue polos, but that just came into being about four weeks ago. So then I was running around. This is what they look like. You know, they're, they're, they're friends. Um, you can use them. And so just stepping forward a little bit. But what I'm seeing right now in the, in the call data, it is mostly person down. And that was the theory that that's where uh, we just need a lot of help. It's so hard. I keep getting asked about this in the press. It is, I want to say the reality. I'm not going to because I'm trying so hard not to say it. It's very, very hard uh, to describe what person down looks like, what it actually means by the data, because we type that in 911. So somebody calls in and they really do say, there's a person, you know, third in pine, he doesn't look good. He doesn't, I'm worried, I can't tell. And that's, that's the narrative. And so then we go, okay, well, this is a person down. And the question that we have got a bunch of questions to try to indicate, is this an overdose situation? Because if it's medical, if it looks like someone's in a medical emergency, that goes real quick to fire. And then, you know, they deal with that. But as you know, with substance use disorder, it is hard to tell sometimes. It's hard to tell the difference between passed out and napping, you know, and, into, and you know, meditation. Sometimes like we, we get it, we get it wrong all the time. But that's what we're responding to It's priority, you know, two and three really all are in the same bucket. So I've got to sort through those again and figure out how can we refine protocols because I'm sending sworn officers often, again, to somebody who's napping. And that's just not a good use of resources. It's really frustrating. Um, what the team has done a lot of so far is transport. And one of my favorite stories from the first week was officers um, quickly recognizing this team downtown and, and yelling like, hey, care team. You know, so the, the officers tease me about the hands, the logo. So I'm, I'm getting that signal sometimes. But if you're, are you care team, can you, can you transport this person? So they had already done a little intervention. They knew where the person needed to go. Um, I think in this case, it was back to supportive housing, and we could do that. So I think in a perfect world, that sort of collaboration and coordination, especially in different neighborhoods, um, starts to take shape, because that would be ideal. I've got the We Deliver Care folks around. You know, there's a lot of people on the streets right now trying to help, but they don't know each other very well. And it's not clear. I had talked to the CSOs yesterday for a while. It's not clear who should be called first. And the last thing I want is for it to get um, territorial. That's just absurd, you know, when people are suffering. So we just want to get really coordinated really fast. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> um, my question is about the 911 that being pulled out. I mean, because I had a lot of uh, yeah. disagreement with that. I mean, yeah. all the police 
departments around the country. Not one is there for a particular reason. Yeah. And the way sometimes the calls get dispatched. Yeah. That was a concern because we've had a couple uh, that was dispatched incorrectly uh, uh, in, in ways in time that I was uh, time of death, some yeah. minutes, some things got lost. Uh, and also, how does CIT, Fighters and Adventures, still work in this, you know, because we were responsible for that part of it, that mother's work. But that, so yeah. how does that, um, how does that still work uh, uh, in, the, in, in the way that this is being designed? Yeah, well, I just want to like pause and applaud you for a number of reasons. Um, so the, the emphasis on CIT is still profound. In fact, I would say that this iteration and co-response is just fanning that flame, that we need to be upskilled. I contend that, generally speaking, if you're talking about any kind of violent crime, there's a mental health aspect there, right? This is not a, a logical, full-functioning state of mind um, that drives us to those types of actions. I think folks calling into 911, if it is a high priority, if it's one or two, there's an element of trauma there. And so I think we need to accept that. I mean, trying to divorce out what has an aspect of mental and emotional health and what doesn't, well, virtually nothing. I mean. If you're calling for um, a non-emergency, there's something in the road, maybe not that. But most of the time, we need to get comfortable that anybody interacting with humans in any state of emergency needs to be highly upskilled. Not just to understand human behavior and psychology, but to understand cultural differences and the way that we define emergency, what we consider violent. I mean, there's so much variety. And I think that part, it's, I want to attract people who are fascinated by that and who like it and who are, who are up for the challenge. Um, I have lots of stories from my life about being in different parts of the world and even in my own way of being, being in a state of emergency and people could not tell because I'm talking about it like a professor, <laughs> you know, but um, that was a labor and delivery story, you guys. When we're all good friends, I'll tell you that story. But, you know, it's just really important that we, we continue to upskill. I like that, um, again, I just really support what SPD has done because it was there was so much good movement that direction right. long before consent decree right. because of people like you, right. you know, so um, yes to more of that. As far as 911 goes, you're exactly right. I've said before, I think, you know, pulling it into a third department, it may have been the right thing, but it was probably done for the wrong reason. It was certainly done in the wrong manner. It is. I cannot describe to you how difficult it is on the back end to disentangle these systems. I, we still are not out of it. That's why when I log in, I've got the, the SPD badge still. It's because, you know, we're part of CAD. Like there's a, the, the foundational operating right. system That's we right. both stand on right. Right. And, um, is, is connected. So places where they've done that, it is good to have an objective, they call it a PSAP, you know, to a, a 911 that serves um, multiple teams. That's a good design. but. When it's done well in Denver, it was like a 10 year process. It's right. just a long process forward. That's right. So I think me acknowledging that in 911 to folks and also reminding everyone on the police side that 911 didn't secede. They didn't choose to go. And then to 911 saying, police didn't fire you. This was not, this was a decision that was made by other folks. And I think just reminding everyone of that has been helpful because it was painful. Yeah. It was painful. These were, these were partners and, and comrades. And now it is a challenge to try to forge connection and, and just empathy. Right. It's very hard in dispatch, you know, and it's very hard to be in patrol right now. And then the press is always like, why such a long response time? And I'm like, because there's six officers tonight in East Precinct, and, you know, and there's mandatory minimums. And so everybody's getting to the calls as fast as they can. Um, 911 was understaffed for a while, and now we're doing better. It, but still, in an ideal state, my guess is we'd have probably 40 more folks because of furlough lines and things like that. So um, I think it's going as well as can be done right now, but you were not wrong that that was a, um, a perilous step to take, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question about like um, services offered to the staff that are doing the work, yeah. like because you're doing a lot of social work and it can be draining. Yeah. Do you, what is offered to them, and is it like similar to what police have, or yeah, how do they make sure they're taking care of themselves? I love that question. Yeah. What's interesting is that nine one one was not; those folks were not considered at all through the lens of um, peer support and well being. They organized for themselves uh, historically. They have a little peer support group to acknowledge one another, to commend one another for exemplary service, try to take care of each other. But that was one of the first things I did, because again, I'm from this trauma responsive environment and training that says you have to be exceptional. If you want to retain folks, you have to have exceptional resources and infrastructure. Because again, people who have this type of background, 
Um, you know, it's kind of like the cobbler said having no shoes. You know, they just do, they tend to feel like they're good at self-care and, and minimize how much they need. And, and the, the way that we absorb um, trauma and, and difficulty and dissonance and, and just take a lot, there's a lot of vitriol right now. There are a lot of people screaming at you right now in this work downtown. It's different for me as well. Then it wears on you, but it gets normalized as you don't think about it until the day that you just collapse, you know. And there is there's new research about suicidality in 911. Um, it, it's so stressful. I think it's probably like air traffic control, you know, where you have to be so vigilant. They are so scared of misstepping. And so even when I talk about, you know, improvisation, one of the call takers was like, Amy, we don't like ambiguity at 911, you know, it's, and I thought, yeah, of course you don't. Of course you don't, because you're so scared of failing someone. They're scared of failing the officers. And so that's why any alternative to police response is interesting, because dispatchers are trained to think someone could get killed. You know, if I send a care team instead of a team of officers, that person could get killed, and then I live with that. Now, that is, um, a, it's, I think, a valid fear, but it's based on nothing has not happened since 1989. And that's really important to know. It doesn't mean it couldn't. We all run risk, you know, in human life, we run the risk, but um, that is, it's not valid. It's just a fear that is kind of born of this um, cynical training. What we did was we engaged quickly with um, a third party resource that provides support, levels of support. So it is similar to what SPD has, because we know that even if we've got internal mechanisms and support and, and HR, and sometimes you, you want to talk to someone anonymously. Um, the, and then there's simple things. There was a day, do you remember the, there was a, a fire and a homo, homicide suicide fire. Do you remember this a, a couple months ago? That was on a Saturday morning. And I had already been, you know, hot down this path and working on it. And I, I happened to be on the floor I like to sit there and work as this was happening. And suddenly you can feel the, the energy in the room just a shift. And it was interesting to watch again, the composure because all these calls are coming in. One of the callers is I, I think an 11 year old, right? So just deeply upsetting to, to any person. Um, so we respond to that a couple hours later because I was there, you know, I had quickly let the deputy Jake, he already would have known anyway, but I circled back too to say, are you aware of this? Um, and I, I know the, the call taker um, who actually is leading peer support was a person who really navigated that particular um, reporting hour. But I asked him after, I said, you know, how, do you get to go home soon? And he said, um, he said, I do in two hours, but I'm coming back at 11, uh, at 2300, right? So he was, we do a lot of overtime right now. And I said, okay, and I didn't intervene, but it, it was just interesting to hold space with him to acknowledge that what he did was exceptional. And he said, yeah, that, that call reminded me of every terrible call I've ever taken. You know, he's talking about these different elements um, and was again, very calm as he expressed it. And, and I said, yeah, I can imagine. Well, later, again, Jake did a beautiful job. He just said, no, you, this is administrative leave tonight. You take this off, you know, we've, we've got you. Um, so that this this young man could have two days out and then he came back. Now, I love that story because I love watching the way that this team comes together, the community. I admire Jake so much. You know, I haven't worked with these people very long. So it's interesting how we reveal ourselves at certain moments. What was problematic is it was coincidental that I was there entirely. It's coincidental that Jake is who he is. There, there's nothing in our operational policy and protocol that says when somebody takes this series of call or you know, this type of call, there's a quick, there's a quick intervention here and it's just understood. So we are working on that. And, and by January one, that will be in place. It's just important. Thank yeah. You. Yeah. I can send you more about it too, what the, the specific vendors we're working with are. Um, yeah. Just wanted to make sure it's happening. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate that. It's bizarre to me that it, that it didn't, that it wasn't thought of, but I think 911 has been thought of as like secretarial work, like customer service for whatever reason. Um, because phones are involved. I don't know. It's very strange. Yeah. Are there any questions from folks online? I have there's more questions in the room, I'm sure, but I want to make sure folks online have an opportunity to ask questions. I don't have a question. Uh, sorry, this is Philip Sanchez speak. I don't have a question, but uh, I just wanted to acknowledge just again, thank you for sharing uh, just even that, that story there this morning. It really touched me in a, in a personal way. 
uh, I've been a pro criminal prosecutor for 15 years. I know a lot of other people have similar backgrounds, but um, you know, taking a moment to to recognize the trauma that other people are going through that you just don't account for um, just really makes me appreciate the folks that, that in the work that you're doing even more so. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, thank you, Philip. I, I have a question. This might get into the theoretical, so I hope. Oh, yeah. um, but you know, the, the care team is, is it's a new resource. It's a new approach to certain types of calls, and um, I know it's still new and very early. But um, are there mechanisms in place to measure outcomes mm -hmm. of this new resource and this new team of, of these types of calls versus before it came about? Yeah. Um, and how the outcomes and the interactions with with subjects of the calls are changing or improving? Yeah, yeah, it's such a good question. I, again, as a researcher, I know you, as far as outcomes, we actually wouldn't know for probably a generation. We can look at outputs right now, and, and the outputs I'm interested in are response time. So are we getting, I'm just looking at, you know, 900,000 911 calls. Are we getting to more of the calls? Are we getting there faster? It's gonna to be tough with only six people to, to really measure that, so I'm almost gonna to have to take a subset. Um, again, look at a specific call type and say, in these hours, under the, like 11, 11 to 2300, is it better? Um, I'm very focused right now on sentiment in fire and in police. And a lot of what I, I've done a lot of qualitative research, so I don't mind the squishy stuff. A lot of it's to do with perception. In conversations like this, I, I perceive that we feel like this is the right step forward, that you know we can start to see a path where we may have a more appropriate response, more community driven, a more compassionate response in some regards, um, but also that it might be a way to have more of what we need rather than always swinging so far one way or the other. Um, because I was around and, and you know, <laughs> nationally in that conversation in 2020 and 2021. And I think that sometimes we get so disappointed um, with our own, our own society, our own humanity, design flaws. And so there's this, this strong overcorrection. And I talk about that in mental health a lot, you know, that it was not a bad idea in the 60s to say, we shouldn't institutionalize people. You know, that's not good. We do best uh, with family in the context of community. There are lots of types of supports that could be more useful than interventions. We all agreed. Um, so we stopped spending money on that. No more institutions, but we did not backfill. We did not. So we didn't design the replacements first, right? And figure out how to bolster community, how to really um, create and provide resources, but then operationalize it for people in distress. We didn't do that. We just stopped spending money on it. And now here we are. And, and it, that's what I perceive has happened a little bit when it comes to enforcement. I, um, you were there, but it was just spontaneous when I talked about justice and mercy. But again, that goes back to childhood, you know, is someone I am so, um, so optimistic. And anytime I see behavior, even the most heinous, I, I perceive that to be, you know, many things have gone wrong. Many things have gone wrong. And I don't know when it started. Um, but that's just a very compassionate take, isn't it? You know, I'm kind of ethically like an, almost like an evil denier. Now I'm in crime data, so I have to rethink this. But, you know, that's just how I think about it, that if somebody is living and breathing, that there's probably a way. But I also know the role of accountability, um, the role of uh, free will, and how we, when we transcend really difficult um, circumstances, when we are helped, um, that we sort of, we become attached to the, like the heroic strain in our own lives, which allows us to achieve more. And so... Whether or not, I mean, even watching this council election, that was really interesting to me. It was an indicator that um, outside of any political issue that we're starting to get more comfortable that two things can be true, that we, we do need to intervene, that I always say fentanyl is different. That's because it is. The, the path from fentanyl use to death is very short <laughs> by comparison. And so then I have to challenge my own thinking that says, you know, again, I self-determine my way through. I might need help and I might need an intervention, but I will choose, you know, to get clean, to live a different kind of life. That's how it works. Nope, it, there's not evidence that that's how it works right now with fentanyl. And so if we acknowledge that and, and we're scientific about it, then we have to think, okay, if we do love this person, if we do have concern, how do we act? How do we act? How do we design? What do we pay for? Um, so that's a total rant from what you asked, but it really is qualitative. Does the, does the community feel like we are moving in the right direction, that if we had more of this, it would be a good thing? Do officers feel like they are getting to the work that they're trained to do? 
um, more efficiently. And then as far as outcomes, I mean, in, in, ideally, and even in Albuquerque in three years, it's not an outcome, it's an output, but it looks like perhaps crime is being reduced, you know, and um, staffing is going up across these different teams. It looks like there may be more stability in the community overall. So, I mean, if you could see that in 20 years, like that would be a really decent outcome. If Seattle looked, if we, if we all felt, you know, very safe and happy to work and play downtown Seattle, I mean, I actually think that's what we're going for here. You know, is that folks who need help get it, they get it early. We can start working upstream rather. Right now we're so far downstream both with crime and with crisis. I mean, we are to a, almost to the place of no return for a lot of folks, and that's not what you want. It, I, I said the other day it should look more like rapid rehousing, where we see indicators that there's trouble, we see them early, we catch them early, we intervene, you know, before we just lose a whole generation. So, yeah. I can ask you about the, when SPD will be deployed, and also what do you think about the people in the revolving door, because all of you do not have any uh, I, you know, I mean, you don't have enough spaces. I yeah. mean, you know, I mean, they've taken people to Harborview yeah. for years and then they back out. I mean, the lady got tased a few years ago, she was naked. Uh, uh, they yeah. took her to Harborview, she was back out. And, yeah. and then we got her in treatment. And then they let her out, she didn't have housing, so she's back out there. Yeah. So there is a really a revolving door yeah. that I don't know how being fixed. Yeah. Uh, then SPD, I mean, can you explain when SPD will be deployed? Yeah. You know, I mean, like it is in the press conference. Yeah, so what they have, and again, there's a, an MOU now, I think that was publicized uh, with Spog, so everyone, and I frankly, I've really enjoyed the labor conversations, like once I got to engage in them, because I, I do like collaboration, and I don't think that there's a lack of crisis to respond to, so I think just articulating who goes where when, um, and the, you know, these different represented groups, what do they prefer to do, what do they want to do? Police will have, for the foreseeable future, always situational awareness and can't go. So we're responding right now to, you know, person down three, which, again, most are two. So this means we think there is absolutely no chance, you know, of trouble. This is somebody who needs shoes. This is someone who needs a ride. Um, when we respond, police always right now, they can't go if they want to. They're on the radio. You know, we, we can basically one is a dispatch and the other is more like an invitation. This is happening. What what the cops have been telling me from the beginning is like, we don't want to go <laughs> down there. So again, it's a funny reverse narrative from what I sometimes read in the press. You know, I'm saying, will you please go? You know, just please go so that we can do this in a measured way. And there, so it's in five years, I'm going to look back and I'm going to chuckle at a lot of things. Right now, I don't have time to be that amused. But um, I don't I don't think that they want to go to these because they're very busy and because they don't feel useful. But they can if they want to. And so it'll be interesting every 30 days. You know, I'm just going to kick out a report that says um, this is when they went. And right now, every day, there's a survey after every call, you know, on both sides that says, how did this go? Like, what resources, what happened, basically? Did you take someone somewhere? Did you connect them to resources? Um, you know, what, what was disclosed or understood? Did you feel safe? That's a major, uh, you know, again, qualitative question for the MHPs. And that's, if you look at Durham's dashboard, they, they have the most beautiful uh, analytics about how this is going. And it's cool because a lot of it's just focused on how first responders feel. And I came in thinking I would be focused on how community feels, but that actually is not going to be a leading indicator because you don't have, an, you're not going to have enough data, right? And if we're just living our lives, we don't really know what's going on unless we're affected by it. So um, as far as um, Harborview, I can tell you, you know, the, the first academic I spoke to on this job is, um, his name is Alexander Heaton, and he's part of the policing project. He's at NYU. And he answered a few questions for me and then said something really simple. He said, Amy, you just, you've got to figure out where to take people that is not the emergency department and not jail. And I was like, cool. And I repeated that a few times. And then once I started doing more shadowing in the field here, I thought, well, I actually don't have the ED or jail either. I actually have no place, you know, there really, I mean, we are at capacity everywhere. And that is a profound problem. I'm happy about the, uh, the crisis center levy. And I know Matt Goldman well at this point, who's directing that. He's so smart. He's such a good thinker. And I think it's trying to get these new, I think there's going to be nine, right? Trying to get these new centers online as, as quickly as possible. But I don't know what to do about that because Harborview is struggling. When I talk to the doctors there, everybody's having trouble retaining because it's just not what you signed up to do. 
right? If you signed up to be an, you know, an ED nurse, you didn't think you were going to be running, you know, really a community center. Um, it, there's, it's already traumatic to have to go to the ED. And so I really feel for people who are just in medical crisis, who then are exposed to a lot of other um, manic or sometimes violent behavior in the ED. So I just acknowledge it's a huge problem and I don't know what the solution is, but I know that stuff sits more on the county level. Um, and, and also when I'm talking to federal policymakers and you know state representatives, elected officials, we got to figure out an actual investment nationally, you know, or some some reform and reimbursement rates and things like that. So well, we are um, unfortunately over time. Uh, we mm -hmm. could spend so much more time with you. Uh, so I think we're just going to have to invite you back. Uh, well, you can tell that I really enjoyed it because it's actually possible for me to only spend 10 minutes if I'm not enjoying yeah. it. So, but yeah. this was a really wonderful presentation. Yeah, we're so grateful for all the work that you're doing and all the thought you're bringing to these really hard issues. Um, and you know, really excited to see things you're doing so far and look forward to, uh, you know, I hope we can have, a, have you back and have more of an update there. Yeah. Get going. yeah, I will come routinely. Again, I'm across the street, and yeah, yeah this would always be a priority. Yeah, but and anything that, in any um, criticism or anything that you observe or any concern, just I keep saying amy.smith at seattle.gov. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank, thank you so much for being here. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, well, that brings us to the next item on our agenda community police commission updates. We can start with co chair updates. Um, go ahead. And Defer to Co Chair Hunter for a moment. I have some updates as well. Okay, only a, a couple from from me. Um, as a follow up to um, Ms. Apollonia Washington's presentation two weeks ago, uh, two commissioners did have uh, contacts at Vulcan, uh, the property owner near um, A for Apple Child Care Center, and they reached out uh, to their contacts to in the in the hope of expediting uh, cleanup of the parking area and to provide greater safety uh, to the area. Um, with the uh, newly elected council members that will soon be uh, uh, taking their positions, um, CPC is reaching out to those individuals, um, letting them know what we do and see if they have questions of, about the ordinance and the accountability system. So that's my update. Um, then the other thing I'd like to add uh, is just as a, as a co-chair, um, uh, I see Danny is on uh, online today as you know, we're really excited to introduce Danny um, as our new pol uh, senior policy analyst. And uh, she, or sorry, Danny has been um, reaching out to uh, commissioners on work groups and, and doing more work with the work groups. Um, I'm just asking commissioners yet again, if Danny reaches out to you, um, please respond to them. Um, please uh, uh, help get the work groups um, going. We're trying to uh, go into a period where we're going to set an agenda for next year, um, and we're really fortunate to have Danny here working with us. So, if you if you see an email from Danny or a call from Danny or whatever, um, please respond and uh, get those work group schedules going back up again. Um, and then with that. Um, uh, I will turn it over to Interim Executive Director Holly Ellis for uh, ED update. Wait, I just want to make sure everyone can hear me. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I've been having trouble with this headset. Um, okay. Hi. I'm really glad to see all of you. Just a moment. Um, so most of the CPC staff, except for Keisha, who's with you in Seattle, we are at conferences out of town. So I'm in Chicago right now. Um, I have a couple updates. Some are shorter, some are longer. The first brief update that I want to make is that we are beginning the process of hiring the communications advisor. So this is an open search. It will go through the ready, regular city human resources process. And we anticipate having the position filled. Usually it's at about three months. Um, that job ad will be posted soon, and we will be reaching out to you to plumb your networks for good contacts, anyone that wants to be a PIO for the CPC, because it's such a critical position to share our message message and our work with the public and with stakeholders. We're really excited about getting this filled. Um, another on the personnel side has to do with the deputy position. So most of you were involved in the ordinance rewrites that the CPC was doing in spring and summer um, that were signed into law in July of 2023. 
And so that included one of the most important things, in addition to reducing the size of the commission, included the position, creating the position of a deputy director. Um, this would be an additional FTE for the CPC and provide really important support and stability to the organization. So that was uh, supported in the mayor's budget, which I don't know if any of you are following what's going on with the budget, but it is, it's going through the process right now. And so once that all ends and the budget is signed and finalized next month, we will be able to begin the process of uh, setting up that new position. Again, this is brand new, so it's not like replacing something that was there before. So it takes a little bit longer, but that's another thing that we're really excited on the personnel side. So I mentioned that many of us are at the National Association of Civilian Oversight of Law Enforcement Conference. This is NACOL um, in Chicago. There is also staff here from the Office of uh, the Inspector General and the Office of Police Accountability. And this really is the primary conference for civilian oversight agencies for law enforcement, but also corrections. And the CPC attends every year. So I also have to mention that our community engagement director, Felicia Cross, who's on the call, was also on the planning committee for this year's conference. So because this one is so important and really central to what we do, I wanted to describe some of the topics that are covered at the conference. Um, working with police unions and collective bargaining, I went to a session on that and it was very interesting because the president of the police union from Spokane was there to talk pretty frankly about what it looks like from their perspective, which is something that I know is of interest to the CPC. Um, there were also sessions on evidence informed assessments from law enforcement agencies, trends and state preemption of local oversight. Um, and then, of course, changing a police culture, uh, the, really the importance of supervisory practices in police reform. But there's a lot more. There's this is really a jam packed conference that's very narrowly focused on what we do. Um, as part of this conference, I went separately to the executive leadership forum all day on Sunday. So this was for executives of for a variety of oversight agencies from very large and established agencies like New York and Chicago to brand new. There are some oversight systems that are just a year old or less. And so they're just starting to get their footing in terms of the legal environment that they're in, as well as funding, staffing, all the stuff that you know we all deal with. Um, one of the things that I learned is that a lot of these agencies in various places are facing the same challenges that we are. Um, clarity of purpose, oversight at different levels, budget, challenges with elected officials and changes in elected officials, as well as agencies themselves. And we also discussed how difficult and emotionally taxing the work of law enforcement oversight is. That's something that's really been a theme throughout this conference. And I really appreciate that the organizers of the conference have centered this. So this has been a very valuable and something that I really glad the CPC is part of. Um, and then there's also Danny's on the call. Uh, Danny is already at another conference that Danny and Jessica, the other policy staff are going to be at, which is the American Society of Criminology Conference. That one is more academic in nature, but that this is where we can really learn about sort of cutting edge ideas, best practices, research informed ideas and concepts that we can use at the CPC on the policy side. Okay, the second update I want to make, uh, because this is relevant to, to many of you, is um, we provided input into the work plan of OIG. This is an ordinance requirement under section 3.29.360G of the accountability ordinance. So this is something that the CPC does every year. Um, this year, the CPC provided four recommendations to the OIG work plan, and these came from CPC policy staff, as well as the police practices work group. And um, like before, we've had follow-ups to requests we've had for other OIG reports. So the first one I want to mention is actually directly connected to, um, to the discussion we just had with CARE. So one of the things the CPC has repeatedly asked of OIG in the work plans is for an audit or review of the 911 dispatch center, so which now does include CARE. Um, this used to be more directly in the purview of, of our work because they were part of the police department, but as Reverend Walden noted, now they're a separate agency and they still, because they're so closely connected to what we do and the oversight and the concerns of community is a top priority for us. Um, it's especially important this year, uh, as in addition to other years, because of the additional responsibilities that uh, Director Smith identified in terms of the other people that they're responsible for. But as she pointed out, the CPC has identified for many years, fundamental errors on the dispatch side um, that have contributed to slow response times, sometimes dangerous situations for people, um, and also situations that resulted in lawsuits to the city because of failures on the dispatch side. So this is very important to the CPC and has been for quite some time. 
Uh, the next recommendation we provided was a review of SPD policy 5.001. POL 10, so this is about professionalism. The policy is that employees should strive to be professional. And this came from our own policy staff, Jessica Ferris, um, because this is also related to another ordinance requirement from section 3.29.3608 of the accountability ordinance, where CPC is required to review closed OPA investigations to identify opportunities for systemic improvements. And this is one of them that we thought was very important. So the professionalism policy covers a broad range of actions deemed to be unprofessional, such as the use of profanity or derogatory language or being rude to the public. And the CPC is interested in the interpretation and implementation of the policy because it, the term unprofessional can be challenging to define. And you can see how unprofessional behaviors just in the past year um, can really undermine the goals of effective policing and community trust. Um, the examples that we've dealt with at the CPC have been the mock tombstone and body cam video, but there's more. Um, so the CPC is reviewing, is requesting from OIG a review of this policy to better understand when officers are disciplined for being unprofessional and how that discipline is implemented and what types of behaviors are often di disciplined implemented and what might be overlooked. So we want to know how superiors are notified of unprofessional behavior outside of OPA complaints and what barriers exist that prevent officers from being mm -hmm. reprimanded for unprofessional behavior. And then the next recommendation for the OIG work plan came from the police practices work group. And I went, want to thank all of you on that work group for coming up with such thoughtful recommendations. So this one is connected to another SPD policy, which is about implicit bias training and measurement. That's um, SPD policy 5.140 on bias-free policing. So the police practices work group identified cultural incompetence, lack of self-awareness around implicit bias and perceived lack of care to address or resolve this bias as a key challenge to SPD's delivery of respectful, professional, and dependable police services. So this is connected to our other request to review the professionalism policy because many of the most salient incidents that we've identified this year have been centered around inexcusable behavior by SPD reflecting a failure for compassion, empathy, and understanding of the communities that they serve. So SPD does have a duty to ensure the training is provided and accountability is held with regards to bias-free policing. And so what we requested of OIG was an audit of the adequacy of how SPD is implementing that policy. And then finally, Dr. Ellis, we request- Dr. Ellis, sorry, I, yes. I'm sorry to interrupt you really quick. Um, but we're I'm so sorry. So if I could just entertain a quick motion to extend our meeting time to, um, I think, let's just say 10 20. That should probably be enough time to finish it. Um, is there a motion to extend the time to 10 20? I motion to extend to 10 20. Okay. I'll second it. And is there uh, any anybody opposed to extending to 10 20? All right. Sorry, Dr. Ellis, we're extended to 10 20. I'm sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. That's no problem at all. I, I was. Uh... <laughs> I was very excited about the input we're giving to OIG's work plan, so I lost track of time. Um, but the very last one, I'm almost done with my updates, has to do with, again, something that we've requested of the OIG uh, for several years, but it becomes more salient this year. And this is an evaluation of SPD's response to hate crime reports, specifically of anti-Asian um, Asian American hate crime data from 2020 to the present. So this was highlighted in the past year due to actual or perceived incidents of anti-Asian hate crimes that have been made, made the news and been of concern to the community. So those are all my updates. I'm gonna put in the chat um, the OIG reports that you can see because when you look at their work, work plans from multiple years, you can see how the CPC provides input into the work plans as well as OPA and then what they have done on those. And we wanted to have the OIG here to present on what they plan to do with the work plans, um, but they're also at the same conference and so they're not available. We hope to have them at a future meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ellis, for that really helpful update. Um, and now uh, we will hear from uh, Director Cross engagement director cross who's all, as dr Ellis mentioned also at the conference and uh, director cross's team um, is also at the conference and we will now hear from them on uh an update on community engagement um thank you can you hear me yes we can okay sorry i don't have my camera on because there's uh the internet service here in this in the hotel is not very stable so hopefully i don't go out um First of all, I would just, I, I don't know if Amy is still in the room, but I just wanted to acknowledge that uh, the month of November is uh, Native American um, Heritage Month. 
So I did, I did want to acknowledge that and, and for anyone else on the call. Um, we are here at this conference and we are um, planning, we're working on, uh, community engagement is working on a 2024 uh, engagement plan, a scheduling, a, a um, our, our strategic plan for 2024. And um, I'm asking all of the uh, commissioners, if you have any thoughts, ideas, any um, meetings or, or at events that you want, need, that you already know about, that you want us to calendar, please um, let me know. I will be sending out a survey just, just to ask for some of your, your input and thoughts as we um, strategically plan for 2024 and do, do the calendaring. I would like to also acknowledge that um, South Southeast Asian community is starting, or they're restarting their um, community advisory council meetings. So that's, uh, Joe Nathan, he, he has already put that on your calendars. So that's um, open and available for anyone who's interested to, to attend. And, and please make sure you let me know if you, when you do attend, if you attend. attend. Um, the other, uh, as far as the conference is concerned, it's been a very, very good conference. The workshops have been excellent. Um, it's been confirming, reaffirming, and and just a overall affirmation of how important and crit critical um, community is to the to the work of uh, engagement and to the work of reform. And so we did. Uh, me and my team yesterday at at the um, at the luncheon, Kristen Clark, the U.S. Attorney General, Kristen Clark was was um, um, at the keynote speaker. Sorry, that's my geek too. She said her computer died. Just to let you know, um, she was at the luncheon, and her basically her whole speech was about Seattle and how Seattle has done a magnificent job with community engagement, and talked all about the plans that. Um, Dr. Offtelli talked about as well at um, in in Fort Worth. Um, it, was, it was cool because my my team was with me, and she came right over to us and gave us a big hug and acknowledged our work and thanked us for um, the work that is going on in Seattle. And every one of these conferences, every one of the workshops has mentioned Seattle in one one place or another. But the biggest biggest driving force is all about community. So. Um, that was very enlightening to hear. And I'll turn it over to Joe Nathan. He has a, he has a little bit more to add. Joe Nathan, we can't hear you. You're on mute, Joe. Joe Nathan, can't hear you. Apologies. Saying greetings from Chicago. What well, I'm saying, surprisingly warm out here. It's like 60 degrees. The sun's been out all week. Uh, Lake Michigan's nice. Oh, just adding on to what uh, Felicia was saying on the calendar, I believe the, the meeting for the Southeast, uh, uh, there's a council meeting that's tonight. So you can check the public calendar. There's one tonight. Um, but that said, I'm just going to briefly uh, just tap in to the North Precinct uh, Advisory Council. That was on the first. Just give you some brief highlights about that. And uh, for the YouTube, we can get her back going. She'll, she's going to follow up with uh, some updates from the Muslim community. But um, the first on the first November first, it was a, a great session. Uh, wow, I just love I love the way the uh, North Pack's uh, meetings work. They're just, just great, well, really condensed, but re really thorough and just really informative. So they led off with uh, talking about safety with Caitlin Yep and uh, Sarah Lawson, um, talking about crime prevention. So they were just giving a lot of great helpful tips. You know, they're doing a lot of these more of these presentations. Um, you know, just encouraging folks to use that Find It Fix It app. Um, talking about the crime dashboard uh, on the SBD, uh, SPD website, um, and uh, but you know, and, and so they shared a variety of tips. But the main thing, you know, one of the things they're just kind of just bringing out was just you know, um, your stuff can be replaced, but you cannot be replaced. Just getting people into that mindset, and that philosophy, and just going over a lot of tips on just how to secure yourself, be it from transportation to your vehicle, what you're by yourself with other people. Um, so if you can, uh, I work to get more information about uh, future. Uh, sessions that because they do have full sessions i'll work to find out what those dates are and i'll make sure i put that on the calendar um uh you know a lot of what's going on in north seattle uh the sex trafficking piece is still uh still a thing of course and, uh, so 
Megan Westfall, uh, she's a Seattle city attorney. She talked about closing some of the motels to reduce some of those sex, uh, sex traffic crimes. <laughs> Additionally, uh, Captain Lori Agard, I believe I hope that's her last name, and Lieutenant John Lamp, they shared a lot of great data uh, talking about violent crime, how it's down 13%, but how motor vehicle theft is uh, increased by 49%. Um, uh, they were just talking about updates with carjack, the carjackings, as they were saying it, the bump and robs, how people were intentionally bumping folks uh, to get a reaction, how folks come out and then they rob them. Um, they were talking about uh, high school vehicle and convenience store robber robberies that are happening in the area. Um, they're, they were talking about patterns with certain groups, a certain number of groups doing these uh, doing these crimes. They were even talking about mass juveniles and stolen vehicles, like like consistently in these Kias and Hondas. And we're talking about the connection. They're saying that a lot of these vehicles that were stolen are coming from uh, South Seattle or South King County, or even in the downtown area. And they're using those vehicles to commit the crimes on the North end. So they were just talking about some of those connections. Um, so those are some of the key pieces, some of the key highlights. Again, I'll work to uh, update you more. Um, and with that, I don't know if Margit is available to speak, but I'll pass it on to her if she's free. Thank you, Joe Nathan. I'm not we're sure. Trying, is yeah, we're here. trying to get her the, um, well, she, I guess she'll have to give another update because she's, we're trying to get her the phone number to call in, but it's not working. So okay. yeah, she had, she had an update about the Muslim community, but uh, we'll work to get that to you. Okay. Later. Thank you so much, yeah. Jonathan and Director Cross. Really appreciate that update. Um, I would just like to take liberty as a co-chair real quick to kind of piggyback on what Director Cross was saying and, and engaging commissioners on a work plan for community engagement 2024. Uh, please take Director Cross up on that and if you have some thoughts or ideas or uh, just connect with her and provide that input uh, the other thing i'm asking commissioners to do is um, engage with your own community um, and uh, and think about what priorities you you would like to see the cpc take on in 2024 uh, the co-chairs have been busy working with uh, director ellis and, and staff on what uh, 2024 priorities should be for the CPC. A lot of it is carrying forward some of the priorities we've been working on this year, but we want each commissioner in their community to engage, to engage in that process. So um, please think about that, talk with your community and bring some ideas to the co-chairs and even um, attend a governance committee meeting, which is every Friday afternoon or almost every other Friday afternoon before a uh, CPC meeting. So. That is a, a, an open invitation and, in fact, a request from the co-chairs. Um, so with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Commissioner Workgroup Updates. Um, we'll start out with Complaint and Appeals and Commissioner Levitt. Um, hi. Um, just a quick update from Complaint and Appeals Workgroup. Um, we are expecting Dr. Rosenthal's paper um, draft paper um, this week. And so kind of any time we'll get that um, and have the chance to review it. And we have a meeting scheduled with him um, and the members of the work group at the end of the month. And I think at that time, um, we'll have a pretty significant updates and um, be making decisions about sort of the next stage of the planning process and consultation process. So right now we're just eagerly waiting for his um, paper to come through via email and we'll go from there. Thank you, Commissioner Levin. Thank you for all the work you're doing on that work group. It's, it's so important. Um, and thank you for that update. Uh, the next is police practices uh, with Raven Nicole Tyler. Sorry, it took me a second to find the unmute button. Um, we don't have too many updates right now. Um, like Director Alice said, we did provide um, some feedback and input for the OIG work plan. Uh, so just working through that. And I believe that Officer Mullins is still um, going through the process of getting ready for that presentation that we're all looking forward to. Um, and uh, Raven, Raven, I just wanna thank you for taking the time to provide that input for the OIG work plan, especially at a time when I personally know how busy you were. So um, thank you for doing that. It's really valuable and we're looking forward to hearing from OIG soon on how that uh, impacts their work as well. So thank you. Of course, um, thank you. Uh, last, we have behavioral health. Um, although I, I do not believe we have a commissioner present today from Behavioral Health with Erica Newman and Lynn Wilson from Behavioral Health. I think both are uh, with uh, excused absences today. So um, unless anyone here has an update from Behavioral Health, I think 
we are done with the commissioner work group updates. <clears throat> and so with that, I'll go ahead and turn over to the last item on our agenda, which is staff department updates. And um, we might have an update from Danny. So can, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Um, I'll keep it kind of brief. Um, I've met a few of you already, um, but for those of you that I haven't met in person or online, um, I'm Danny. I'm the new senior policy analyst with the CPC. I've been uh, picking up where Mina left off. Um, so I've been here for a couple of weeks, still catching up to speed, so no major updates, but uh, I did want to use this time to explain um, to everyone sort of what my role is here and what kind of support you can expect from me. Um, and then what my expectations are from the commissioners and the work groups. Um, so my role obviously involves policy analysis. That's that's the obvious one. But a large part of it is to organize, facilitate, and lead the CPC work group, similar to, to the way that Mina did. Um, and to me, this means uh, being an accountability partner and um, setting expectations for one another, um, setting a consistent meeting schedule, and I think most importantly, reinvigorating the purpose of the work groups, um, reinvigorating everyone's sort of excitement around the work. Um, so my first step in this is, you know, information gathering, getting historical context. I don't want to move forward without without that. I, you know, I'm new here, and I, I definitely want to understand the historical context around the work that you've done. Um, so I've got plenty of documents to read that is helping with that. But for me, it's really important to make connections with all of you individually so that I can uh, better understand who you are, um, why you're here, and what you would like to see from me and um, the staff at the CPC as a whole. Um, so I've got, I've met with some of you already, I've got some more one-on-one -on -one scheduled, um, and I'm waiting to hear back from a few of you. So my personal goal is to have met with all of you individually and to have at least one more work group meeting by the end of this year. Um, and the purpose of that is so that I can identify themes in our conversations to help inform um, the work plan for 2024. Um, so if you haven't already, please, please get in touch. Um, you know, I'm open to meet in person, virtually. Um, I'm very flexible. Um, how, however you'd like to meet with me, I, I can make that work. So um, if you haven't received my information, please let me know and I'll give it to you. Um, and that's 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 all, that's all I have. Um, I look forward to seeing you all soon. Thank you, Danny. We're so excited that you're here and, and picking up the, the policy work um, and leading the work groups. Um, and I'll just say something that I think Reverend Walden could probably say so much better than me because she's she's got the history and the experience on the commission. But you know, historically, the work groups are where a lot of our work plan comes from, a lot of our work priorities come from, and uh, under our bylaws and the history of of our of the CPC, these are commissioner driven um, and staff supported. So um, it's really important that you know each commissioner brings their own community to the commission, and that perspective is really important on the work groups. Um, so please uh, bring your ideas and your experiences uh, to to the work groups. Um, respond and meet with Danny, um, and and you know to, again the co-chairs invite folks to show up to a governance meeting if they have some ideas they want to share. Um, but we are in kind of the end of the year planning for 2024 mode, and we really want to hear from folks. Um, so I, I, we have a couple more minutes, but I just want to see if my co-chairs have anything to add before we adjourn. Okay. Um, well, thank you everyone for being here. Um, really grateful to see everyone and, uh, everyone have a really wonderful Thanksgiving break. We'll see you back on the first Wednesday in December. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.